Uh, the topic I want to preach to you about this evening is the topic of prayer. And uh, I think it's an important topic. It's not one that we preach a lot about. Uh, but you know, the things that we don't often preach about are sometimes the most important and fundamental things. We preached a sermon, uh, you know, just recently about Bible reading, you know, and that's a, they say, boy, that sounds like such a basic sermon, you know, but really it's the basics of the Christian life that are going to build you up. And often it's the basics that we lack as Christians. These are the areas that because they're so simple, because they're just presumed that they're done, and just because uh, it just seems like it's common knowledge that Bible reading and prayer are, ought to be the very foundation of Christian life, because it's just assumed that it's there, often those are the things that get neglected. And really, that's unfortunate because they are some of the most important aspects of the Christian life. Uh, you know, Bible reading, of course, is one, and prayer is as well. I mean, really, it is the foundation of the Christian life, these two things. Growing in knowledge and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ through, through the reading of the Word of God, and then actually having uh, uh, you know the, the ability to go boldly before God's throne and to make uh, your your needs known unto Him in a time you know when you're in a, a time of help of need to go to Him boldly and to and to help Him to uh, move in your life and get the things that you have need of, and uh, those make up the the basis of the Christian life. You know, and sometimes if we step back from our life, we'll. We might have the Bible reading down, but the prayer is missing. Or maybe we have the prayer, we're real good at that, but the Bible reading is, is wanting. You know, if we step back from our life, sometimes we say something just seems out of balance. I mean, imagine a building that's been built, on, but they only put the foundation on one side. You know, they just say, well, this half of the building has a foundation and this one doesn't. You would step back and that building would look weird. You'd say, well, what's wrong? What's with this crack in the wall? Why, why does it seem like this is weaker over here? It's because that foundation hasn't been laid. So these are really just the essential, just needful things that just we need to be consistent about in our Christian life. And, uh, you know, so a lot of times we just assume that, that it's being done, that it's not, you know, and, and sometimes we become uh, neglectful in preaching it because there's so many other things to preach at, about. But, you know, be, at the beginning of the year, it's always good to get back to the basics. That's always something we, we can never get enough of because, again, those are often the things that are wanting. It makes me think about, uh, I used to hear this illustration about, I don't remember the, the guy's name, but there was this famous football coach. And it was said of him that every you know, preseason, it was a professional team, he would walk out in front of the whole team of, of men that had been playing football for just years, you know, professional football players, and he would hold up a football and he would say, this is a football. And he would start to explain the just most, you know, this is the end zone. These are the, and he would explain all just the basic just common knowledge that these guys have learned over and over and over again. Because the fundamentals really in the Christian life, that's what's going to help you succeed. You know, we could get up and, and there's time and place to preach on, you know, the deep things of God, the, you know, the series through, you know, the end times prophecy and, you know, and, and get up and rip on this sin or that sin or this, you know, whatever it might be. Those are all great and needful, but really what's going to build you up in the Christian life, what's going to help you to stay in it for the long haul are the fundamentals, the basics, Bible reading, prayer, these, you know, church attendance. These are the things that are going to help us to stay in it. Now, you're there in Luke 18. If you would, I'm going to have you keep a bookmark there, and then I want you to go over to Luke chapter 11. And when you get there, put something there as well, because we will come back to both of these passages a little bit later. But we're going to look at Luke 11 first. So this is a sermon about prayer, but what, you know, and I'm going to talk a little bit about first. I'm not going to really go into a lot about the actual how to go about praying. Because, <clears throat> you know, and, and, and that would be a good sermon to preach, you know. That we, you know but what, is, what good is it to learn how to pray if we're not praying? So really what I want to do tonight is just motivate you to pray. Motivate you to, you know, you know if you're not, you know, or, or you, maybe you've fallen away or never have, to you know, reinvigorate your prayer life and give you the reasons why we ought to pray. Now there in Luke 11, of course, we could turn here and we could talk about how we ought to pray. I mean, that's what's being asked and explained here, right? It says in verse 1, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. So it's a good thing to want to learn how to pray, right? And we could teach a whole sermon on that. And maybe perhaps someday soon we will. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so in earth, give us uh, day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
So this is a great outline on how to pray. Now, what Jesus is not saying, pray these exact words. You know, he's not saying every time you pray, get down and just pray this prayer and you're good. Because that would be, and if you would, turn over to Matthew chapter 6. Again, keep something in Luke 11. Go over to Matthew chapter 6. If God was just telling us there, if the Lord was just saying, hey, just pray these words, you know, what, how, all we'd have to do is memorize that and then prayer would just be this, you know, emotionless, uh, un impersonal time that we spent before God's throne just reciting, you know, just rote memory of just some, just some phrase, you know. So what, what is this? Well, this is a good outline of prayer. This is a, if you want to know how to pray, this serves as a great outline. Uh, you know, you start out by saying, you know, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven. You know, when we get down to pray and, 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 and you know, entreat the favor of a holy God, it might, we might do well to start off by praising Him. You know, so that, that's a good point there. You know, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, let's start out our prayer time with some praise. You know, let's praise God, lift up His holy name. You know, give him the honor that's due him. And we could go on from there. You know, thy kingdom come. You know, God, let your will be done. Let me know what it is. Help me to know the things that you want me to do in my life. Show me. And you could get specific. You know, ask him these things. <clears throat> and it goes on from there. But again, I don't want to go into how to pray tonight. But, I, but we got to, you know, we can't just read that and then say, have people assume that they might not go home and do that and just get down and say, well, that's what he said to say, so that's what I'm going to say. That would be considered a chant if every time you were to pray to just say these words. That would be what's called a vain repetition in the Bible, just repeating words. And there's religions out there that practice this. You know, uh, multiple religions, you know, Buddhists, uh, Orthodox, the Catholics, they all have some kind of just this rote, you know, you think of the, the, the Hail Marys, the Our Fathers, that's what they say. You know, go pray this many Hail Fa Marys. Go pray this many Our Fathers. You know, the, the Orthodox Greeks, you know, they, they have their, they just sit there and chant for hours. And God says, don't do that. He explicitly says in the Bible, don't do that. That's what he says here in Matthew 6. Look at verse 5. <clears throat> he says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to stand in the synagogues in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy, thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions. So he's even calling it vain. To just sit there and vainly repeat. What does it mean to be vain? There's no meaning. It's empty. It's hollow. I mean, those words might sound nice, you know, coming off the lips, but there's no feeling behind it. There's no heart in it. It's vain. And he says, as the heathen do. It's a heathen practice to just sit there and just say, whatever it is, you know, I don't know any of their prayers. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're out there. But they, he's saying, don't do that. For they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. And that's great because we can learn from that is that, you know, we, we don't have to turn prayer into this just, you know, extended time of us just, you know, rambling on or whatever it is. You know, God, prayer doesn't have to be this hour long endeavor. I mean, that's great if it is. But what about just like your Bible reading? You know, you can think about prayer and Bible reading like this. You know, Bible reading is God talking to you, right? That, people say, oh, God told me, really? Would you, would you read it in the Bible? Because otherwise you, you might want to you know, seek professional help. Right? That voice in your head is not God. <laughs> right? God speaks to us through His Word. His Spirit bears witness with it, our spirit, and it's done through His Word. So that's God speaking to you. Now prayer could be likened unto, is obviously you speaking to God. That's, where, that's your side of the conversation. And it's really just that. It's you praying to God and telling Him whatever's on your heart. You know, whatever it is that you need. It ought to come from the heart. It ought to be genuine and sincere. Not just some vain repetition. Not just you, re you know, repeating something that you memorized a dozen or so times. There's no feeling in that. It's vain. It's empty. And he says here in verse 8, Be there, ye not ye therefore like unto them, for what your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. That's a profound thing to think about. That before you even go to God to ha make your request known unto Him, He already knows what you're going to say. And that's because of the fact that you know, you're, you, God is omniscient. And we're going to get down to here in a minute. But Jesus, you know, He forbids this chanting. He says, don't use vain repetition. And then he, and he tells you why. And the why is, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask Him. You know, you, why, why waste that opportunity to go and make your petitions known unto God by just vainly repeating something 
You know, when God knows you have needs, God knows that there's things in your life that you're struggling with, there's areas in your life that you're trying to work on, that you need God's strength for that day, and you're just going to come before His throne and just repeat something. And He's like, look, I know what things you have need of. Why don't you, not, don't be as the hypocrites are, don't, be as the, don't do as the heathen do, pray a genuine, sincere prayer. And it doesn't have to be much speaking if it's real, if it's genuine, if it's from the heart. It doesn't take a lot. <clears throat> So that being the case, that being the case that God wants us to pray, there's a way we ought to pray, that it's expected of us that we should pray, we must ask ourselves this question. God knows what we have need of. So the question is this, what is the purpose of prayer? And that's the title of the sermon, the purpose of prayer. What's the purpose of it? I mean, you say, we could talk about how we should pray, when we should pray, you know, all these things, the, the, the nuts and bolts of prayer, but that's, that's all in vain if you're not going to do it. And, we'll do, and we're not going to do it if we don't understand that there is a purpose behind prayer. What is the purpose of prayer? And before we really get into it, you know, there's some things we have to understand. And one of them really is that God is all-knowing. God is omniscient. You know, he said there, God knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Why is that? Because God knows everything. Uh, and and uh, we're going to look at a lot of scripture here tonight. So, if, you know, sit up, perk up a little bit. Hopefully you got a cup of coffee in your hand. But uh, if you could keep up, go over to Isaiah chapter 46. Again, keep something in Luke 11 and Luke 18, but go over to Isaiah chapter 46. We'll be coming back to Luke a little bit later, a couple times. But God is all-knowing. You know, it's kind, of, it's kind of, we might even say, well, if God knows everything I have need of, why even bother asking? Well, we'll get into that. Because that is the purpose of prayer. <clears throat> and he says in Psalms 147, verse 5, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. You know, God understands all things. You can't say, well, God only knows so much. You know, everybody in this room, there's only so much knowledge that we have. We only know so many things, some more than others, right? But God, his, it's infinite. There's nothing he doesn't know. And that includes everything that you have need of before you even ask him. You're there in Isaiah 46, look at verse 9. Remember the for former things of old, for I am God, there is none else. I am God, there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. He's saying, look, he's declaring the things, uh, the end from the beginning, that from ancient times, the things that are not even done yet. God's saying, you ever notice that, that Jesus is called the lamb slain before the foundation of the world? Why is that? Because God already knew what was going to happen when Christ came here. He already had already knew that Jesus was going to come and die for our sins. God already knows the beginning from the end. He knows everything that's going to happen. And he can declare it. Go over to Isaiah chapter 42, just a few pages back. Isaiah uh, uh, 42. The Bible says in 1 John 3, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. His, infinite, his understanding is infinite. He declares the beginning from the end. And he knoweth all things. He knoweth what things we have need of before we even come and ask. Look here in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things I do, do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. God's saying, look, I tell you about things that are going to happen before they happen. I mean, go read the book of Revelation. That's all that is. Things that have not yet come to pass. The things that, that are, that will be, <laughs> and uh, that have been, that are, and that will, are, are, are going to come to pass. That's what that is. God tells us everything that's going to happen. In the future, to, I mean, obviously we don't know everything. He puts a cap on it at the end of the millennium. And he says, "That's all I'm going to tell you." And even John said there were things that were not lawful for, or Paul rather said there are law, things that are not lawful for him to speak. And John was told to, to seal up certain things, not to reveal everything. But God, He tells us, He declares us uh, things to us before they even come to pass, even in His Word. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. I mean, people are, get so wrapped up sometimes in wanting to know the future. Well, it's like, read the Bible. That literally tells you the future of humanity. It tells you the future of the earth, of mankind. You know, you don't need to call 1-800-MISS-CLEO. You know, somebody, some people know what I'm talking about, right? Did she get some of your money? No, I'm just kidding. But uh, she's out there, call Miss Cleo now, send me your credit card, I'll tell you the future. You know, and <laughs> anybody knows what I'm talking about, then you're, you're, you're probably as old as I am, right? Going back, the, the, the lady in the... In the was it the 90s, you know, on the television at all hours of the night? You know, the fortune teller. You know, people want to know the future. Well, it's right in the Bible. God knows everything. 
Uh, go over to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. The Bible says in Psalm 33, The Lord looketh from heaven, he knoweth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike, he considereth all their works. God knows every person. Jesus said that very hairs of your head are numbered. I mean, that's something. I was, you know, uh, Karen was, you know, feeling the, the beard's coming back, by the way, folks. That's what this is all about. I'm not just getting lazy up here. <laughs> that's another story. But, you know, Karen, she's, she's feeling it. She goes, Dad, you know, kids, they say some of the, the craziest things, right? They just tell it like it is. Dad, you've got b black hair and you've got gray hair and you've got white hair. I'm like, yes, yes, I do. Thank you for pointing that out. And, and she says, and I said, uh, well, count the white hairs. You know, she's checking it out on the chin, and, she start, and she, I could feel her start to try. She's like, there's too many. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? Well, think about that. Though. We'd go, wow, let's go count each other's hair on our head. Let's see, you know, and, 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 and try to do that. Right? That'd be impossible. But God says, I know. I could tell you exactly how many there are. And when one falls out, you know, or for some of us, a few more, you know, when that, they start to fall out, God, you know, the count goes down. You know, God knows everything. He knows all the sons of men. <clears throat> He's omniscient. Look at uh, Psalm 139, where you are, verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and, know, and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. God knows the thoughts you're going to think before you even think them. <clears throat> thou compass my path and li my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, lo, uh, lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it all together. God knows the things that you're going to say before you even say them. Uh, thou hast beset behind me and before and laid mine hand upon, uh, thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. You know, can we say that about, about this tonight? Do we feel the same way as the psalmist here? That understanding this about God, that He knows our downright, our, our down sitting and our uprising. He knows the words that we're going to say, the thoughts that we're going to think. Is that really sunk in that that's the God that we, that that's the true and living God that we serve? The God that knows everything about us? He says, uh, uh, this, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, verse 6. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Verse, jump down to verse 15. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did yet see my substance, yet being unperfect, meaning not complete, not whole. Uh, and in my and, and in thy uh, book all my members were written, which in uh, continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. You know, so what's profound about this passage here is not just that God knows all of your thoughts, but that God also thinks about you, every single one of us. Just, you know, and, and, and he says that he thinks about us so much that they can't even, they can't even, there is the sands of the sea. You know, you can't count someone's hairs on their head. Go count the sand on the sea. That's how much God has thought about us as individuals. You say, well, who has the time to do that? Well, God is, you know, outside of time. God has all of eternity. And we, we, and, you know, we just throw that word around God. We don't, sometimes I don't think we really set it in who it is we're talking about. And who, what, what God, or who God is, you know, outside of time, you know, uh, endless, with, you know, without end, without beginning. You know, he has all the time in the world to sit there and think about us. And that's what he does. You know, I mentioned that a few weeks ago in a sermon about the amazing fact that God knows all the stars by, num uh, by name and he, he, and he tells them all, he counts them, but the whole Bible is about man. It wasn't just him bragging about how great he is. It was him dealing with and talking about mankind. That's how great God's thoughts are towards us. So, you know, God does care about us. God, you know, as great and marvelous and wonderful as he is, you know, it's, amazing, it's even more amazing to think that he condescends to such to comes down solo to sit there and think about me and you because at the end of the day who are we you know we're we're just another just another face you know we're just another person sometimes it feels like that in the world we're just you know a social security number or something but that's not how you are to god god looks down and he knows everything about you you're down you're down sitting you're uprising you know he knows everything you think everything you say before you think or say it and his thoughts towards you are innumerable they cannot be counted <laughs> so it, it, what's amazing about prayer, so I'm trying to just kind of lay the foundation here. What's the purpose of prayer? 
Well, first of all, we need to understand something, that God, you know, he thinks about us and that God knows everything, that God is omniscient. And what, one other thing that God knows is that God knows, because some people, they, I think they shy away from praying because they're, they're afraid they're going to do it wrong. They make it into this overly complicated practice. You know, I'm not holy enough or, you know, whatever. They have these excuses and they're afraid that somehow they're going to mess up prayer. You know, when they asked, when Jesus, when they asked Jesus, teach us to pray, you know, that wasn't this long dissertation on how to go about it. It was just a pretty rough outline. You know, you might want to consider who you're talking to. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, and, and that there are some other things about prayer that we could talk about. But one thing you're never going to do is pray wrong. Now, you could pray for things that aren't, you know, that's not to say you might ask for something and the answer is no. But hey, God still answers prayer even when he says no. Amen. But here's the thing. God knows what we should be praying when we pray wrong. You can't mess up prayer. I mean, even when you do do it wrong, it's, God still makes it right. Go over to Romans chapter 8. That's what the Bible says here in Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> you really can't mess up prayer even when you do. It's kind of a paradox. I'm not saying you can't pray wrong, but hey, when you do pray wrong, God makes it right. So really, you can't pay wrong, even though you can. You know what I mean? Oh man, that's one of those things. But look at uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know uh, not what we should pray for as we ought. I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray for. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That's one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit that we have, one of the privileges that we have as, as born-again believers with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that even when we don't know what to pray or how to pray, or if we pray wrong, the, the Holy Spirit knows what we mean. And he goes to God and says, this is what they're trying to say. This is what they mean. This is what's in their heart. And really, you know, the purpose of prayer isn't so much of getting it right or saying all the right things. It's just the fact that you need to do it. And we're going to get into here, you know, what is the purpose of prayer? Well, one, uh, one is to receive the things, as Jesus said, that you have need of. Right? That's what he said there in Matthew chapter 6. That your heavenly Father knoweth what things you have need of. So what is the purpose of prayer? To get the things that you need. Well, you know, I don't want to take advantage of God. Don't worry, he can spare it. You know what I mean? <laughs> God wants to show himself mighty on, on, on our behalf. God wants to do that. I mean, some of the most, uh, you know, some of the most, uh, uh, the times that I grew the most as a Christian is when I saw God answer prayer. Not even my prayers. You know, I'm talking about prayer. Whenever I bring up prayer, I always think about this one, this one story about um, God really does know what things we have need of. I mean, I mean, the most basic things, like work boots. Okay, this is a story I share whenever I talk about prayer. But, and I apologize if you've heard it, but I remember when we were working, we just got married. We just had Karen, our firstborn. And, you know, I was working in excavation. And that's really hard on footwear. You know, you'd spend a lot of money on boots. You'd buy $150, $200 boots. And, you know, you're up and down in the sand and the rocks and the water and all day and the heat and everything. Boots just get worn out. And, uh, and we, had, we had worn out my boots to the point where, you know, the sole was kind of coming off the bottom. I was losing my sole, man. But it was coming off, right? And rocks were getting in there and sand. And uh, I was like, every, every, every break I'm putting duct tape around it. And we're laying like uh, we're laying municipal water lines and storm drains and stuff like that on this one job, so it's really wet. So my feet are just getting wet and drenched. But you know, just married, just had a kid. You know, wasn't exactly the most lucrative career digging ditches, and uh, we didn't have a lot of money. So boots just kind of weren't on the budget for a while. You know, we weren't getting. I was like, well, we can't really afford the boots. And uh, <coughs> unbeknownst to me at the time, my wife. You know, this is probably reflects more poorly on me. I should probably have been the one doing the praying, but my wife is praying for boots for me. She's saying, you know, she need, we need to get some boots for my husband because of his feet. You know, if you lose, if the feet go, man, it's, that's rough. So <laughs> she's like, get, get him some boots, right? Got to get paid the bills. So, um, so her mother, I'm trying to recall, it's been a while. So her mother goes to uh, Massachusetts, right? Yeah, to visit her brother, and she hadn't seen in a while, and she's there with her brother, and her brother just out of the blue goes, it just pulls a pair of boots out of the, out of the closet in Massachusetts. 
It says, hey, I, I bought these. They're too big. Well, I'm thinking, well, why didn't you return them? You know, maybe you lost their seat. I don't know. Maybe God burned their seat up. But he, uh, <laughs> she says, take these back to Michigan, and maybe somebody there needs them. And so we, I remember we went over to her mom's house after she had gotten back from that trip and uh, to Massachusetts. I'm trying to say that word because it's hard for me to say. <laughs> so I went in there, and I see this pair of boots on the kitchen table. I said, what are those? And she says, oh, my brother gave me those if, if somebody needs them. And I said, well, I, I, I'm like thinking, yeah, I need them. Ten and a half. They perfect fit. <laughs> Brand new boots. And I was just like, and I'm like, oh, cool. I didn't really think a lot of it. Then I find that my wife's just like, I was praying about boots. <laughs> like she, for her, like it was a major answer to prayer to me. It was just, you know, a pair of boots. <laughs> but it just goes to show you that God knows the things that you have need of. What's the purpose of prayer? To get the things that you need. Like a pair of boots. Like, you know, there's so many things that we could, you know, we're probably missing out on because we just don't pray about it. You know, we have some need, we have some struggle, whether it's financially or some item, like a pair of boots or whatever. You know, if we would just stop, have we stopped to pray about it? And we just, we're so used to just, especially as men, just being self-reliant and just like, well, we're just going to have to tighten up the belt this month and, and save up some money. And, or we're going to, you know, we don't ever stop to think, well, let's just pray about it and let's just ask God for what we need and, and see if he's, he'll do it. Because God wants to show himself mighty on our behalf. Because you know, say, well, it's, what's the big deal about that? Well, it's a good testimony about prayer, isn't it? I mean, it's just a pair of boots. Yeah, at the time, it was just a pair of boots, but I've gotten some sermon illustrations out of it, right? And hopefully it's that story alone, you know, help motivate some other people to spend some more time in prayer asking and telling God the things that they have need of. <clears throat> the Bible says in James 4, I'll read to you, it says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your own lust that you war in your members? You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, you cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not. Why? Because you ask not. Why do people go without and end up going to the such extremes as even fighting amongst themselves over things? Over, over, over things? It's because they don't ask. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. And, and, and that you may consume it upon your lust. But he says you have not because you ask not. And Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Knock and it shall be open. Seek and you shall find. You know, God wants to answer prayer. And that's one reason, that's one purpose of prayer. You know, maybe that'll motivate you. Maybe there's something you need right now. I mean, even if it's just as carnal and simple and basic as a pair of boots. You know, God's wanting to answer that prayer. And we have need of many different things. So that's one purpose of prayer. But what's another one? How about to stay right with God? You know, if you, were, if you were actually looking to pray to God and have your prayers answered, it would probably affect your, 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 the way you conduct yourself. You know, if you're like, well, I'm, I, need, I have need, things that I need God to do for me, that I need God to, to, to uh, help me with, and my, you know, whatever it is, you know, you, you should pick something. You know, I've got to pray to God and ask Him to help me with this or get me this or provide this, or whatever it is. If you knew that's what you are going to do, don't you think you'd be a little bit more careful about how you behave in front of God, who knows you're down sitting and you're uprising, who knows what you're going to say and think, you'd probably be a little bit more careful. I mean, it's just like, I'm kind of getting ahead of our, myself a little bit here, but I mean, you can think about it like a father with a child. You know, God's the father, we're the children. You know, I'm a lot more likely to give my kids the things that they ask me if they've been well behaved. You know, if they, if they were in here, you know, scribbling on the walls this afternoon, slashing the, the, the chairs with a knife, pulling the stuffing out, dancing on the piano, pulling the strings out, you know, uh, just going, running amok in here or whatever. Yeah, and then we go home to go back to Phoenix and they're like, can we stop for ice cream? No way. The way you've been behaving, you're not getting anything. Well, you're going to get something, but it ain't going to be what you want. <laughs> right? That's the same thing with God. You know, God will God will give you what you want. Uh, he'll give you what you need, but not what you want. Right? <coughs> so, if we want things from God, we want Him to come through for us and, and bless us and give us those things that we have need of, you know, and, we're, and we know we're going to be asking for those things, we'd probably be more careful to stay right with Him. So that's another purpose of prayer, to keep you right with God. <coughs> Go over to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. The Bible says in Psalm 66, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So don't get the idea or the impression, I don't mean to give the impression, that you could just do whatever you want and God's going to, you know, God's just eagerly waiting to answer every prayer you have no matter, no matter what. You know, God does expect us to keep up, you know, some level of 
Christian conduct in our life. You know, to behave ourselves in a certain way. And he said there, you know, hey, if I regard iniquity in my heart, if there's some sin in my life, and we're look, we're all going to sin. There's another reason to pray. You know, confess your sins. And if you confess and forsake your sins, you know, you'll be forgiven. You know, uh, 1 John 1, 9. You know, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We know we're going to sin, but if he's saying, if I regard iniquity in my heart, if I go, oh, there's something wrong with my heart. Oh, there's some sin in my life. I, don't, I regard it. I know it's there, and I just don't do anything about it. And I say, yeah, but I'm not going to change. But I'm not going to get over it. I'm not going to give it up. You know, I'm going to have my bad attitude. I'm going to have my, my sin in my life. I know it's there, and I'm going to leave it there. I have no intention of doing anything about it. I'm not even sorry about it. Then, don't, then God's not going to hear you. God's going to say, well, I'm not going to listen. You know, it's like the kid that comes, you know, you know, has gotten in trouble and say, hey, you know, come on, get your spanking. No, no, you don't understand. She did it. He hit me first. She crossed the imaginary line, the car, you know, all these excuses. I don't want to hear it. It's so often we say as parents, I don't want to hear it. You know, let's just get it over with. One, just get your heart right. Just change your behavior. So that's another reason to, 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 to pray, another purpose of prayer. To keep your heart right. You're there in Matthew chapter 21. Look at verse 21. Matthew 21, 21. Jesus answered and said to them, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do that which is done to the fig tree. Remember, he had withered up the fig tree. But also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. All things whatsoever ye ask uh, in prayer, believing, ye shall, shall, you, uh, ye shall receive. I mean, that's a pretty powerful statement. God's saying you can move mountains. Now, now, don't go and pray that God would throw Mount Lemon. One, because we need that for the summer camping trip. <laughs> but don't expect that. When I remember reading that, I first got saved. Like, well, if that's really true, then I should, I should be able to do that. Is, Jesus really, is that really what Jesus is saying? Hey, you should go see God move a mountain for you. But what he's saying is like, you know, <laughs> what's the purpose behind God moving a mountain for you? Just to look cool? Yeah, I moved that mountain. It was my prayer that got it in the ocean. God's not going to get glorified in that. It doesn't help you with anything. In fact, it hurts you because now the camping trip is in the ocean. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? But, but look, the purpose is that, you know, like, God, like through prayer, God can do anything. You know, it, but here's the, thing, here's, the, here's the caveat. It's it got to be in his will. If you want to be right with God, you're only going to pray those things that are going to be glorifying to Him. They're not going to just be selfish. Does that make sense? You're not going to go, well, I'm just going to take the, you know, it's not you. I heard a uh, pastor preach and say it like, uh, just recently, it's not like the force. That's not what this is. This isn't Star Wars. You're like, ah, oh, Lord, move the mountain, you know. This isn't the mountain you're looking for. <laughs> Whatever. That's not what it is. He's, he's saying, look, if you prayed and you're right with God, you could do anything. But here's the thing, if you're, if you're right with God, you're not, you're not going to be worried about moving mountains. You know, you're going to be worrying about doing God's will. And uh, the Bible says in Proverbs, and, and staying right with God, you know, what's the purpose of prayer? To stay right with God. It'll help you stay right. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, verse 9, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Abomination is a strong word. I mean, that's, a str I mean, that's like what God uses to describe things that he hates. You know, you know, and you could do a word study on that and see how bad he, a strong word that is. But he says here, who, what does he consider an abomination? Prayer. Not just any prayer, but prayer that comes from somebody who turneth away his ear from the hearing of the law. You know, when someone says, this is what the Bible says. I don't want to hear that. And then you're going to go pray and ask God? Say, you know what? I don't care what you have to say, Lord. I don't care what you want for me in my life. I don't care what things you are asking of me in the Bible. That's, you know, I'm not going to listen. I'm going to turn my ear from that and then I'm going to start making my own request of you. You know, it'd be no different than, than my, you know, me telling my kid to do something and then saying, I don't think so, Dad. In fact, but here's what I want. You think I'm just going to take that line down? You know, that's going to make me upset. Like, excuse me? We're going we're gonna to deal with that. And it's the same way with God. When God hears us or sees us just disregarding the preaching, disregarding the word, disregarding his commandments, just saying, eh. And then we have the, the audacity and the gall to come to him and to make all these requests. He says, that's an abomination to me. I don't even want to hear it. <clears throat> Look at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. I should have had you turn there. 1 John chapter 5, beginning of verse 14. I'll start reading in 1 John 5, 14. It says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, 
that if we ask anything according to His will, those are some important words, according to His will, and His will isn't for you to throw Mount Lemon into a sea. Right? According to His will, He heareth us. You know, we need to pray. If we're going to pray, we've got to pray the way God, uh, pray things that you know God is going to want to do for you. You know, uh, you know God, please help me win uh, the, the, the multi, you know, the, what is the mega millions? Help me to know the winning number of the, <laughs> of the jackpot. You know, I swear I'll give half to the church, you know, or whatever it is. God's not going to answer that prayer because that's not according to his will. But could God do that? And God could move a mountain for you. But he's not going to do that because that's not according to his will. Because that's covetous. That's, you know, that would ruin your life, quite frankly. That's a whole other sermon. And he says in verse 15, And if we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. So, <clears throat> you know, if you're right with God and you're praying in according to God's will, Lord, help me to win souls. Help me to hide Your Word within my heart. Help me to get this sin out of my life. Lord, please, you know, help, you know, help me read my Bible. You know, pray the things that you know are gonna, God's going to want to do for you because they're going to help you and glorify Him and, 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 bring, uh, and, and, and help you be a better Christian. You know, those are the things you have to pray for. Then we know that whatsoever we ask, that we have that petition. I mean, you think God's going to say no to that prayer? Lord, help me to, you know, Lord, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I don't think so. I mean, I'd like to do that for you, but not today. God's going to answer that prayer. You're going to open it. Lord, you know, you pray that before you open up the Bible on your daily Bible reading. Lord, help me to understand this book. God will help you understand that book. Because that's a prayer that's according to His will. You know, instead of praying, you know, whatever, whatever silly prayer, you know, ask for some dumb thing that we don't even need in our life. Or it's probably might even bring, you know, harm to us. Help me win the lotto. Or help me just have all the things that I covet after. You know, you know, Lord, help me to have more time off to go to the lake or something. You know, like, oh, yeah, sure, let me, let me take care of that for you. No, God wants us to pray the things that are going to help us. So those are some of the purposes of prayer, but I want to kind of get into the, you know, what ultimately is the purpose of prayer uh, the, that I think, you know, the purpose of prayer is what? To receive those things that you have need of. Because God knows there's things that we genuinely actually need. Not just want, but need in our life. God wants to provide those needs. Uh, God wa it'll help us, the purpose of prayer is to help us to stay right with God. You know, we're going to pray according to His will. You know, and we're, gonna not, we're not just going to pray things so we can see and say, oh, that was cool that God did that. It's going to be something that's going to help us actually grow as Christians. And the ultimate purpose of prayer is that will God will hear from us. And that's really the purpose of, I, I believe, why. I mean, God know, knoweth, all, uh, knoweth what things we have need of before we even ask. Why even bother praying? Why does God even expect us to pray? Why should we have to take the time out of our day to, just to tell God things He already knows? Have you ever thought about that? I think that's why some people draw back from prayer. So well, God already knows why I need that. He'll take care of it. The purpose of prayer is so that God will hear from you and not be ignored. God doesn't like being ignored. God doesn't want to be ignored. God actually wants to hear from you. God wants you to get alone with Him and pray things that He already knows you have need of just so He can hear you pray. You know, prayer is something that's very special to God. <clears throat> Go to Luke chapter 18 if you kept something there. God doesn't want to be ignored. God wants to hear from us. That's the purpose of prayer. So that God doesn't just become this, you know, this vending machine in the sky or something that, you know, when we put in a few coins, when we feel like it, maybe we'll get something. You know, God is just somebody we might acknowledge once a week or something like that when we go to church. God wants to be involved in your life on a day-to-day -day basis, and He wants to do that through prayer. I mean, imagine, I mean, imagine any other relationship in your life that, was, that you did that. You know, if you're married. You just, you only talk to your wife, you know, when you need the coffee made. <laughs> kind of pulling back the, the veil a little bit, letting you see what it's like in the Russell household, right? <laughs> And, and I'm trying to learn how to make coffee again. I made a cup the other morning and it was like mud. <laughs> it was just like the most potent coffee. Because she's got like all the markings and all the jars and she knows the bounce. I mean, she knows the coffee machine backwards and forwards and I'm just like 
Just put a bunch of grounds, put a bunch of water. It should turn out. All right? But what if that's the only time I talk to my wife? Hey, make me a cup of coffee. And that was it. Oh, Lord, every time I just needed something. You know, have you seen where I put this? You seen, or, or it's usually, have you, did you move that? <laughs> I know you moved it. I always put it there, right? That would not be a good relationship. But isn't that what, sometimes I think it's exactly what we do to God. We're only going to go to pray to him when we really need something. You know, when it's convenient for us. That's not the relationship that you want to have with God. The purpose of prayer is so that God doesn't go ignored. God already knows everything I need. Why should I pray? So that he'll hear from you. Because it's special to him. God likes to hear prayers from his children. And you know, it's pretty, it's pretty cool when you pray something and you watch God answer a prayer. You say, wow, God really is, his thoughts towards me really are innumerable. Me? God's going to answer my prayer? That's really something. Look here in Luke chapter 18, verse 35. And it came to pass uh, that as he was come nigh into Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before, him, before rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? I mean, you ever think about <laughs> that question? Duh. <laughs> what do you think I want? I'm blind. But God asks him, well, what do you want? And I think it's obvious. Hello? <laughs> like you didn't know he was blind? Did you see how hard it was for me to walk over here, God? In fact, why did you make me walk over here? I'm the one that's blind. Is that what the guy, is that his attitude? Duh. No. He says, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And God heals him. I mean, I read that and I'm like, God, why did God ask? Why did Jesus ask that? You know, because he wants, he wants him to say it. He wants to hear him say it. Lord, that I might receive my sight. You know, sometimes I think God just wants to hear from us. That's the purpose of prayer. God knows what you need. And you know what? He's going to make you get up and walk over to your prayer closet and get down on your knees and state the obvious because he wants to hear from you. <clears throat> you know, we talked about you know, the, the relationship, it's like a father and a child. You know, God is called our Heavenly Father. You know, we are called the children of God. You know, that's not a, a coincidence, obviously. And like any father, you know, God doesn't want to be ignored. Go to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Look at verse 11. I'll begin reading in Luke chapter 11, verse 11. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish... Will he give for him a fish, a serpent? Let's bring it in the modern vernacular. You know, if my son comes to me and asks me for a peanut butter sandwich, you know, am I going to give him a knuckle sandwich? No. <laughs> Unless he deserves it. Just kidding. I'm kidding. <clears throat> or if he asks an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, he's saying, look, you guys know how this works, and you're a bunch of sinners. You know, you, you guys know I got this figured out here on earth. You at least have enough compassion for your own kids even though you're both a couple of sinners, that you're kind to one another, you give them things what, that they have need of. He's saying, if ye then being evil, give, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost unto him than ask him? There's a good thing to ask for. The filling of the Holy Ghost. Lord, give me wisdom. Give me knowledge. Give me understanding. Give me the Holy Ghost. Give me that power that, that, he, that I can have through him. You know, God just wants to hear you ask sometimes. <clears throat> so it's kind of like this father-son relationship, father-child relationship. You know, when I come home, my kids, they get excited, believe it or not. You know, I walk in the door and like, they'll, they'll hear the key. Sometimes if they wreck, hear the van door or whatever, the car door, they'll, they'll get it. They already know that's, you start to recognize the sound. Of your, like when I growing up, we had a gravel driveway and I, I would hear my mom's, I could hear the tires hit the driveway, my <laughs> mom's home. Now, admittedly, I wasn't as excited as my kids. I was probably like trying to hurry up and get the chores done, you know, in like 30 seconds. You know, look like I'm doing my homework. Go, oh, hey, mom. You know, but when I, fortunately, I, my kids aren't as rotten as I am, or was. 
you know, when they hear me, they get excited. They don't get, they're not afraid. You know, I walk in the door and Heather Ann's already, you know, doing her little scoot thing all the way over there. You know, and I walk in, ah! you know, and then she's following me around the house, smacking me on the legs. Why? Because dad's home, you know, there she goes. Just like that. They get excited. Now, how would I feel as a father if I walked in and they just all had, you know, just completely ignored me? You know, Karen's there on the couch reading her book like she always is. I walk in, hey, I'm home. <laughs> Nothing. You know, Heather's not interested. Corbin's too busy playing. I mean, I walk in, they're all right there. Dad, dad, dad. You know, that's special. That's dear. We, we love that as parents. You know, that's, from the, it, so that's like the best part of our day it's often, you know. And, it you know, it makes it all worth it. You know, the, the hard day that we just put in at work. You come home, oh, that's why I did that for them. Right? But what if I walked in and they're just like, so how did you get, did you get, uh, you're not going to get fired, are you? Or did you put in a good day at work? You know, did you get enough hours in this week, Dad? You know, we're hungry here. You know, or they just completely ignored me. How would I feel? Especially considering the fact that I know that they need me. That I'm not optional. That I have what they need. And that without me, life is going to be very hard for them. It's the same way with God. You know, there's things that we need from God. But we're going to ignore Him. And God wants to bless us and give us all these things. And all He's asking is, just let me hear you say it. Let just, just let me, just, can you just talk to me for a little while? Just so I can hear you say it. Because I actually, because think about it, God wants to hear from you. I just want to hear you say it. That's the purpose of prayer. So that God isn't just this ignored person in his own house. Being ignored by people, whether they realize it or not, that need him in their life. <clears throat> so we'll just conclude here. If you're, you're there in Luke 11, you know, it's assumed that we'll pray. If you read the scriptures, it says there in verse 1, in Luke 11, verse 1, and it came to pass uh, that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of them, his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Verse 2, and he said unto them, if you pray. Is that what he said? He said, when you pray. It's assumed. Jesus is assuming you guys are going to pray. I mean, why would you be asking me how to pray if you're not going to? When you pray. That's when, not if. You know, and maybe the reason we're not praying, at least as often as we should, or if not at all, maybe we're not praying, uh, and, and the, maybe the reason behind that, and, and let's not forget what happens when we don't pray. It's not just that we don't get the things we need, that God goes unacknowledged in our life on a personal level, like a child ignoring his father in his own home. That's what it's like. You know, maybe the reason why God's going unacknowledged in our personal lives is because we never really understood the purpose of prayer to begin with. That it's not just all about us getting things. That God is actually a lovingly heavenly Father, loving Heavenly Father who wants to just hear us say it. That's the purpose of prayer. That you can have a relationship with God that's not all one-sided. Let's go ahead and close a word of prayer.